Tudor lawyer turned courtier turned Catholic martyr, Sir Thomas More, was also a writer. Among his works is his history of King Richard III. The title, though, is a trick. More wasn't writing history. He was offering a warning, and I think we can see precisely what he really meant. Many insist on using More's work as a non-fiction, as good as primary source for the story of Richard III. They're wrong, and there are plenty of ways that we can demonstrate that. It's worth remembering that More tells us the princes were murdered, then buried beneath a stone staircase, ten feet deep, and no one noticed. But More then says that a priest single-handedly dug them up from that spot, ten feet deep, under a stone staircase, and moved the bodies. So if you want to believe more, then you have to believe the remains currently in an urn at Westminster Abbey can't be those of the princes in the tower. More wrote his history during the 1510s before entering royal service. He didn't publish the work and in fact never finished it. What we read was edited, finished and published by his nephew years after More's execution. To some extent, it isn't Moore's work, and it was never intended for public consumption. A book Moore did publish in 1516 is Utopia. This was something new and astonishing in that it was fiction and acknowledged itself as such. It's a discussion between the central characters of what would constitute a perfect society, much of which, like married priests and a ban on private property, were things we know Moore was vehemently opposed to. The idea at the core of utopia is that a perfect society can never be realised because giving advice that will improve the lot of ordinary people to selfish, self-interested princes will never lead to change. They will always protect their narrow interests at the expense of the majority. In 1516, Moore must have been wrestling with this very question as he gravitated towards royal service at the court of Henry VIII. How do you make a selfish king do things that benefit others? Here, we see Moore experimenting with an old style of writing in his history and a new one in Utopia. Based on which one he finished and published, we can see his preference. And how was his history the old way? Well, that's something we've lost sight of today, but which makes sense. C.S. Lewis once said, rhetoric is the greatest barrier between us and our ancestors, an invisible wall. Joseph Levine has explained why this is important when we consider Moore's work. He wrote that for the humanist rhetorician, it was poetry and history along with oratory that furnished the models for expression and the fund of examples that constituted political wisdom. History was a pool from which political wisdom might be drawn to sustain the politicians of the day. This was the approach taken to writing history in the medieval period. It was never about giving a factual account in a way that we would recognise as history today. History was a branch of rhetoric that was about providing wisdom and lessons that would guide contemporary rulers. Geoffrey of Monmouth is a prime example of just this. He's the man responsible for our view of King Arthur with all its mythical elements. Of Geoffrey and other medieval writers, Levine explained, when they told a fiction, they pretended it was history. When they recounted a history, they included fiction and neither authors nor audience seemed much to care. Viewing Moore's history as, well, history, is to try and sever Moore's days from the medieval period. Moore is a perfect example of this transition, the bleed from one period into another. He was experimenting with old and new, the history of King Richard III and Utopia, running the two projects alongside each other. So, if I think Moore's history is actually allegory, a fiction wrapped up as a truth to deliver a message, can I prove it? And what was the real message Moore was trying to get across? Well, I think I can prove it 
and I think I know what Moore intended us to take from his work. The inaccuracies of Moore's history are manifold and obvious, and that was perhaps the point. Moore gets the name of the lady involved in the story of Edward IV's bigamy wrong. It was Lady Eleanor Butler, me Talbot, but Moore gives her name as Dame Elizabeth Lucy. Dame Elizabeth was reputedly a mistress of Edward IV and possibly the mother of one or more of his illegitimate children, but she was not the woman named in the bigamy allegation. Moore got that fact wrong and it's far from the only one. Historians who try to position Moore as a reliable source of evidence will say he was a lawyer and was well informed. He would have checked and confirmed his facts. But he got this and plenty else wrong. In his description of the infamous council meeting at the Tower of London on the 13th of June 1483, Moore famously has Archbishop Rotherham, Bishop Morton and Lord Stanley arrested and Lord Hastings executed. Rotherham and Morton were in fact arrested. Hastings was executed. On Stanley, Moore tells us that during the melee of the arrests, a soldier seized Hastings and another let fly at the Lord Stanley, who shrank at the stroke and fell under the table, or else his head had been cleft to the teeth, for as hastily as he shrank, yet blood ran about his ears. Now it always struck me as strange that Lord Hastings was executed, but Stanley was spared. It's also odd that just three weeks after this event, at Richard III's coronation on the 6th of July 1483, Lord Stanley and his wife Lady Margaret Beaufort were both in positions of high honour. How could this be when he'd been arrested as a traitor as recently as the 13th of June? The explanation is another mistake by Moore, one that exposes the problem with his information and with treating him as a source. All the contemporary source material for the 13th of June 1483 places Archbishop Rotherham, Bishop Morton there, but not a single source says Lord Stanley was present. I believe he inserted himself into the scene later to paint himself as having been loyal to Edward IV and to Edward V, and of course to Elizabeth of York, who was Edward IV's daughter, Edward V's sister, and now Henry VII's queen. He lied, and Moore bought it. Thomas More was five years old at the time of the events he describes in 1483. Those who seek to rely on Moore as a historical source believe he collected testimony from those who had been alive at the time of the events he described. Perhaps he did, but that doesn't mean that what he was told was true. Those serving the Tudor government had an interest in distancing themselves from Richard III's reign. So Thomas More made mistakes, and plenty of them, that we can demonstrate, yet this doesn't seem to devalue him as a source in the eyes of many. Why that might be is hard to determine, but perhaps Moore simply says what people wish to believe. The biggest clue to what Moore was really trying to say comes in the very first sentence of his history of King Richard III. Moore wrote, King Edward, of that name the fourth, after he had lived for fifty and three years, seven months and six days, and thereof reigned two and twenty years, one month and eight days died at Westminster. Edward IV was born on the 28th of April 1442 and died on the 9th of April 1483. He died aged 40, having ruled for just over 22 years if we ignore the six months of the re-adeption. Some historians will point out that not everyone was certain of Edward IV's dates of birth and age, so Moore is not the only one who gets it wrong. This is simply an effort to gloss over Moore's errors. Why be so precise if you aren't certain? What will it actually take for Moore's unreliability as a source to be accepted? But I think this mistake in the opening sentence is the signpost to what Moore is actually talking about. It's interesting that Henry VII was born 
on the 28th of January 1457 and died on the 21st of April 1509, aged 52. He'd been king for just over 23 years. Henry VII's age tallies much more closely with Moore's very precise figures. I think Moore is writing allegory, rhetoric, that technique C.S. Lewis warned is the greatest barrier to our understanding of the past. History is simply a branch of rhetoric to Moore. Richard III is a convenient vehicle for the real message Moore is offering. You can't openly criticise the king. Moore had learned that lesson under Henry VII. As an MP in Parliament, Moore was instrumental in bringing down one of Henry VII's tax plans and found his father imprisoned on trumped-up charges as a result. Moore's history speaks of the murdered promise of a young king who is replaced by a dangerous tyrant, who in turn must be defeated. For the young Edward V, full of promise, read Henry VIII, 17 when he comes to the throne and bursting with promise after the problems of the final years of his father's reign. For Richard III, read the Henry VIII that England actually got. Henry began his reign with acts of tyranny. He ordered the executions of Empsom and Dudley, two of his father's ministers, because he thought it would be popular. He executed Edmund de la Pole, despite his father's promises not to do so. And he did it just before an invasion of France, in an effort to directly associate himself with Henry V. Henry V had executed Richard of Conisborough, the Yorkist Earl of Cambridge, just before leaving for France. Henry VIII executed Edmund, the Yorkist Duke of Somerset, in a macabre effort to recreate Henry V's exploits and successes. The real Henry VIII had murdered the promise of the young Henry VIII, just as Moore's Richard III murders the promise of Edward V. The warning rings loud and clear. Richard was deposed and killed because of the tyranny Moore portrays. Henry VIII, Moore is suggesting, won't rule for long if he continues down the path of tyranny that he's on. If this interpretation is right, then Moore stopped writing and set his work aside because he entered royal service, where he could influence Henry directly without needing to write obscure treatises. Most recently, some research by Professor Tim Thornton has been in the news. Professor Thornton found a letter that he claims connects Sir Thomas More to the sons of Miles Forrest, one of the murderers that More named. This, it's claimed, proves More was telling the truth. I say there's no way to make up for the myriad problems with More, even if it's true. Miles Forrest who was a real person, had died in 1484. He had a son at the time of his death named Edward. That information comes from a grant made by Richard III to his widow and son. Professor Thornton's evidence relates to an Edward Forrest and a Miles Forrest, two brothers, who worked for Cardinal Wolsey and were in court circles. So Professor Thornton hypothesises these two men must be the sons of the Miles Forrest named as a murderer by Moore. They appear from the documentary evidence to have met Moore or at least to have been known to him. Professor Thornton then suggests that this means the brothers told Moore all about their father murdering the princes in the tower with all the gory detail. Even if we assume that these men were the sons of Miles Forrest, of which there is no proof, but which isn't even really the point, the story relies on an unlikely series of events. If Edward was the only son of Miles Forrest at his death, it's possible that another was born posthumously, Miles Jr. This would surely mean that Edward was probably very young when his father died. Miles would have had to have told his wife what he'd done in excruciating detail. She would have had to have made the decision to pass that story on to her sons in all the terrible detail, to tell them their father had brutally killed two young children, one of them a king of England. She would also have had to have passed on so much detail about the event for them to have been able to relate that story to Moore. Edward and Miles would then have had to make their way to the royal court of Henry VIII and freely tell courtiers what their father had done, that they were the sons of the man who had murdered the king's uncles. 
Would they think this would ingratiate them to Henry VIII? Would men like Wolsey and Moore have continued to employ the brothers knowing what their father had done? Does all this seem feasible? It certainly isn't impossible, but I'd suggest it's beyond unlikely. Wearing a hair shirt doesn't transform Moore's fiction into fact. Besides, Thomas More never meant anyone to take his history of Richard III literally. He was operating within the accepted norms of his times, something obscured for us by the mists of time. We've failed to break down C.S. Lewis's barrier of rhetoric. And all this new evidence proves is the stretching of credulity and the absurdity of attempting to rely on Thomas More as a primary source, and the lengths that some historians will go to to avoid confronting the reality that there's no reliable evidence that Richard III murdered the princes in the tower.